Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you so much, Victor. It's a big, great pleasure to be here with you guys today. Um, I'm really excited. I, I, you know, I'd like to I'd like to say thanks to also to Bere, who's who's been pulling all this together, and also the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and Latin American Studies, and all of those all of all those of you who are joining us from all over the place. I see people from uh, Mexico and California and from all over. So this is really exciting. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, before we start, just a quick land acknowledgement to add to Catherine's. Um, I live and work in Kitchener. Uh, which is located on the traditional territory of, of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples. Uh, the land I stand on today is stolen land and its original homelands of indigenous people. I acknowledge, and we must not forget, the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory. And I honor today uh, indigenous people by doing work that lifts the voices uh, of indigenous peoples all throughout Abia Yala. So uh, with that, I'll let Paul do a little hello and then I'll, I'll take over. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Paul here. Um, like Rita, it's an absolute honor to be here. Um, you know, and I'm really humbled, right, by the number of folks who've come out uh, from all over. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, it's incredibly exciting and, you know, likewise, deeply honored. Um, I myself am speaking to you from Asheville, North Carolina, uh, which is in the traditional homeland of the Cherokee. Um, literally an hour from uh, where the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians is currently located. Um, and I acknowledge that, you know, this is also stolen land, um, you know, under several treaties that have been broken with the Cherokee over the years. Um, and it is important to keep this in mind, right? And as Rita was saying, you know, part of the uh, project of doing work in Indigenous studies, right, is to make sure that these voices are heard and valued, right? And, you know, that we acknowledge and think about and change our relationship with the land. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. Um, one second. Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk to you about uh, our book a little bit about what we do. The way we've uh, laid it out is um, I will tell you a little bit about sort of what Maya literature is, why we're talking about unwriting this literature, um, and then Paul will take over and he'll talk uh, about Seeb, which is what the major concept behind our proposal. Uh, he'll also discuss textiles um, and how Seed can help us read textiles. And last, we'll, we'll head over and look at some poetry and we'll discuss how um, this, 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 um, this approach towards Maya literature through textiles, in this case, can help us see things a little bit differently. It, it, um, what we're proposing here requires quite a bit of work. It requires uh, quite a bit of humility. Uh, so I'm really excited that you're here with us today, but uh, it'll be, it'll be, it might be, it might get uncomfortable at times, so I warn you, be warned. So let's get started. So just to start, just really quickly, uh, the question you might be asking, our book is called I'm Writing Maya Literature, but what is Maya Literature? And generally, whenever you talk about Maya Literature, it's the literature from Mesoamerica, right? Uh, so Central America, Southern Mexico, and Guatemala. Um, and it's usually categorized in three three ways. You usually hear uh, pre-Hispanic, colonial, and contemporary. Uh, we would, if you look at the stuff we do, we'd be talking about contemporary Maya literature. And usually, this is understood as a new literature, like a phenomenon. Uh, but I do want to point out here that even though this is the way it's usually talked about, um, what is new? It's not this literature. It's actually our interest in academia. Uh, for this literature. It's actually the interest of, of the literary market that now is selling some of this literature, but it's not new in that sense. It comes from a long tradition. Um, and so we're hoping to talk a little bit about that today as well. Um, one of the things we're proposing, and we say I'm right, uh, literature. And the reason we do that is because literature, as we use it in uh, the academy, is a Western concept. So when we say unwrite it, we're talking about shifting the way we look at it, shifting um, the parameters that we use to analyze it and, and, um, and shift away from the written word. And we're not doing this because we're being you know, experimental. We're not being fancy. We're actually doing this because this is what the texts are asking us to do. This is what the writers are asking us to do. This is what the producers of knowledge are asking of us. And we have to listen. 
Um, and for that, I want to show you this image. Um, this is an image of um, an older weaver in Guatemala, and she's holding a sign that says, um, or textiles are the books that the colony was unable to burn. And this became, this image was viral. It was actually, the, the sign that she's holding was created for um, the Movimiento Nacional de Tejedoras. They were uh, promoting, they were trying to pass this, this initiative that would protect the intellectual property of their, of their weaving texts. And so this, this, this woman was holding this sign and someone snapped a picture and it became, it, it became a symbol of this movement and it, came, it, it was viral. Uh, but it's interesting because she's asking us to look beyond the written word. Right, like she recognizes that woven texts have knowledge very much like a book does, and they weren't burnt, so that knowledge is still there. So they're asking us to switch, like look at this and in a different way. So it, it's smart to actually pay attention. Uh, so what this this um, entails is also considering other ways of seeing and understanding the world, which is not always easy. It requires us to shift our entire understanding of things. Uh, it might not be the correct way. You know, there are other ways of looking at things. So we're proposing what would be uh, label a decolonial approach, right? We would change the terms in which we analyze these things. We would look at literature and how we're defining it. What does that mean? We need to look at those tools and approaches and really ask ourselves if they're appropriate. Uh, it also requires that we look at our positioning as non-Indigenous readers and scholars. What does it mean for me in North America in, you know, with a PhD, what does it mean to be looking at this literature? And in this case, it might mean that I need to be humble and I know I'm not the expert, right? So I have to, it, like I said, it requires a great deal, deal of humility. Uh, we also need to think about our, our, the effect of, of our practices as scholars, as readers, uh, and how they extend beyond the page. We're not dealing with, with simply a, a word on a piece of paper, it's much more than that. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we also have to think about whose voices we're privileging. One of the quotes that I've included here, it, this is the model for the, the Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional. And, and we'll come back to this uh, later on, but um, it basically says, un mundo donde quepan muchos mundos, a world where many worlds fit. And this is uh, in part what we're trying to do. Make, make, make um, claim the space uh, that has been denied to make sure all these voices are heard, but but they're heard equally, like any other world, and allow all those other worlds in. Um, so what does this entail, right? Like what what do I mean when I say shift the terms? And this is um, this is where it gets really interesting, because it's not just a gesture that we're asking for here. Uh, this is a much more radical project, um, and one and, and a quote that we often Paul and I often gravitate toward because it's beautiful. And this is from Hugo Jamioy, who's a CAMSA poet uh, in Colombia. And this is uh, quoted in Miguel Rochas's book, which is brilliant. Uh, but he says, and I'll read the Spanish, you can read the English. No solo Colombia es un país analfabeta de lo indígena, sino que podríamos decir que casi toda América es un continente analfabeta de lo indígena. Right? So he's flipping those terms. And we're being questioned here. We're as being asked, what do we really know? Uh, and it's, it's quite a radical proposal to look at things in this way, to maybe leave the written word aside for a moment and, and realize that that is not all that it's valuable, right? It's not just about that kind of literacy, there are other literacies. Um, so one of the things I wanna do, um, like I said, we're gonna shift the terms, uh, but it's, like I said, it's more than a gesture. There's quite a bit of commitment in this. Uh, we're going to consider how we read as critics, students, teachers, activists, artists, etc. And one of the things I want to show you is um, I want to show you a poem by Humberto Cabal, who's a wonderful Quiche poet who unfortunately passed away in 2019. Um, and we're going to look at the concept of time. And, and so this is just, just, just to give you an example of how, uh, how important it is to shift, shift the terms, but not merely, not merely say, well, I'm looking at an indigenous poet and this is how I'm analyzing it. I'm being you know, respectful and I'm, this is actually looking at how uh, these concepts, if they're not looked at carefully, uh, they actually affect an entire reading, an entire way of reading. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna show you an example of, of a reading of this text, an interpretation by two different, uh, two different entities. One of them is a, a theater collective that took uh, Cabal's poem 
and, and, and try to interpret it. And the other one is uh, a Maya artist. So we have a non-indigenous uh, interpretation of time, of Acabal's uh, time in Camino al Revés, his poem. And the other one is um, uh, Maya artist, Angel Pollón. So let's get, let's get started with that. So Humberto Cabal, like I said, he's, um, uh, Momos, he's from Momostenango, was from Momostenango. He passed away, unfortunately, in 2019. He's probably one of the most prolific names in terms of, of Maya literature. Uh, lots of poetry has been um, translated into 25 languages or something. Um, and his work is, is brilliant. He, he, um, he wrote quite a bit. He was also kind of a, a he's kind of scandalous too, but in a good way. Um, and this poem, Camino al Revés, I've included the, the English translation, which, uh, oh, no, it's not Paul's translation, sorry, it's someone else's translation. Um, I'll, I'll read it to you in, in Spanish, you can follow in English. Uh, de vez en cuando, camino al revés, es mi modo de recordar. Si caminara solo hacia adelante, te podría contar cómo es el olvido. Yeah, so that, that's Humberto Cabal. Uh, and this poem is, is wonderful. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. There are a couple of things that we have here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some things, uh, but I do want to bring up a couple of things that are, I think, really important. Uh, one of the things is, is that handling of, of time. Uh, that's quite important. This idea of looking back and honoring the past, it's, it's present, right? This idea of you can't move forward without knowing what's behind you. Uh, but there's also a challenge to sort of the idea of progress that we have in the West, this idea of like leaving the past behind and just moving on and, and moving on to bigger and better things. Um, but one of the things he does, he introduces a really dynamic concept of memory um, in which uh, there's a possibility for, for the multiplicity and the simultaneity of time. And I think once you see uh, the uh, Ankel, Ankel Poyon's work, Hopefully that will be easier to grasp it. But I want to show you how this collective, this uh, theater collective in Guatemala um, understood this poem. So let me explain to you a little bit about uh, Caja Lúdica. Actually, let me go back to that. Um, Caja Lúdica is a, is a theater collective in Guatemala. And they, um, they were part of an initiative by the Editorial Catafixia and the Centro Cultural de España in Guatemala. So what they were doing is, and, and I believe this is still ongoing, but I'm not sure with the pandemic. They have this special collection called the Sena Poetica, and they bring poets and, um, and uh, a theater director, and they basically put the poem on stage. They put the poet's work on stage. And, and when they do this, it's, it's fascinating because they work closely with the poet. Uh, out of, they've created 11 of these, the Sena Poeticas. Uh, out of these 11, three have been my artist and one Garifuna poet. Uh, out of the three my artists, Rosa Chavez and Manuel Soc, they actually lent their bodies for this. They actually went on stage and they were part of the performance because their work demands that um, uh, the body to be present. Uh, in the case of Acabal, he started working with Caja Lúdica, so the theater collective, but unfortunately he passed away. So Caja Lúdica was forced to continue the work uh, when he passed away. And they did a fabulous job. So in, there's, in no way is this a slight to what they did. I actually think they did a fabulous job. It's just, it's interesting when you see their interpretation, which comes from a very much uh, Ladino or Western perspective. So what they did, uh, they took a couple of his poems and I'm going to show you an image of, um, well, actually I'm showing you the text. This is sort of the, the directions in, uh, of, the, of the poetic action, what they were asking, and I'll, I'll read it in, I can read it in English, uh, uh, what they were asking to, um, they were asking the actors to do. And they did this in one of the busiest streets in Guatemala and, and I'll read you the text. An actor who watches the sunset begins walking backwards, holding a gourd filled with white sand. With the sand, he draws a five meter long line at the center of Sixth Avenue between 11th and 12th streets in zone one, which symbolically represents time, a sand clock, memory, the dividing line between sunset and sunrise. And it looked like this. So you have, this is just an image. Uh, so you see all the people because this was a, um, a collective theater production, a public on the street, and it was done at uh, a dusk. You can see, you know, all the people standing around. You can see very clearly that line of sand, right? That represents time, and and it's interesting because this idea of the of the um, hourglass, right, filled with sand, it's actually a Western concept. It's a French invention in the eighth century. It's not Maya, and um, well, the sand. You know, you can, you can, I mean, you can get into a debate about that. But then the only Maya element here is the tecomate, that gourd that's filled with sand. 
So that's our interpretation of time, right? It's a, it's a, a line that runs uh, straight down the street, right? And it's, it's represented, you know, you can interpret those, the sand as like each grain of sand representing sort of a memory, you know, that makes up that entire sort of history of that, that, that idea that uh, Akabal was trying to communicate. You know, like, like I said, it looked, it was wonderful. People were really involved, people loved it. But if we move to a different interpretation, and this is Angel Pollon, he's a, a Cachiquel um, conceptual artist. He's, he's very well known. He has, he's fabulous. He has work in, um, I, I believe the, the Reina Sofia has just bought a couple of his pieces for their collection. Um, and he's absolutely fabulous. And he likes working with the concept of time. He's very much about the concept of, of time. So one of the things uh, that he does, he creates this piece and this piece is really interesting. So if, if you look at it, I mean, it, it might seem a little bit funny if you're not used to conceptual art, but basically what it is, is it's two leather shoes and they're both covered in dry mud. Uh, they're set approximately 50 centimeters apart in a straight line with the heels facing each other. And they're joined by this continuous and stretched rubber band, right? That stands in the place of shoelaces. So there are no shoelaces, but this rubber man joins them. So one of the things that it was really interesting chatting with Angel, he said to me, I asked him, I said, well, you were, I, I guess you read the poem and you were inspired by it. He said, no, actually, I, I was working with the concept of time. And then I read a cabal and I'm like, oh, this is exactly what I'm doing. So he named a piece after he found a cabal. And it's really interesting because he's introducing an entirely different conception of time. Uh, here, time's not linear. There's not one line, but we have a rubber band that joins both shoes, right? And it's this continuous loop that, that is flexible, that stretches. Um, and you have the shoes that are facing away from each other. And the interesting thing is you can stand from any angle and you can, you can change your perspective. One can be the past, one can be the future. It doesn't, it's not fixed. That notion of past or present in this case or in future, they're not fixed. You can walk all around the shoes and you'll never find it. So some of you might have heard, you know, this idea of Maya time being um, uh, circular or, or cyclical. In this case, it's a little bit different. It's more the idea that it's simultaneous. Past, present, and future are working uh, in conjunction. Uh, they're they're sort of um, they work together. There's this this um, it's almost like a feedback loop that we have here. It's continuous, it's constantly working together. There's a connection with nature, the soil and the mud that also suggests movement. And that's actually really interesting because um, Angel is able to bring out the idea of space and movement through time with that soil, with that stretchy uh, uh, rubber band, but also this idea of creating a path or marking that path, right? So he's, he's able to do this and you have something completely different uh, when you look at Akaval's poem. Right, because now you have this notion that moving backwards is not a literal moving backwards. There's not a linear timeline, but it's something much more dynamic, something that can be simultaneous. And if you um, uh, often when you when you speak to someone, if someone's giving testimony, for example, uh, uh, and this is from someone I, I worked with, someone who um, a political scientist who was looking at, at testimonials. And she, she mentioned to me, she's like, you know, when people talk about what's happened, they move, like when they talk about time, there's this funny movement between like the past, 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 the recent past, the present, but it's, it's, it happens at the same time. And it feels kind of messy. And it's, it's actually this, it's this simultaneity that's constantly informing your present, your past and your future. It's always happening, um, you know, in uh, multiple times and simultaneously. Um, so that's, that's um, this is sort of that understanding of time, like I said, it gives very, it yields very different results when you look at it this way, right? A Maya understanding and uh, a non-Maya understanding, there's very different results here. Um, it's, it's quite rich when you look at it from that, from a Maya perspective. Um, but there's also something interesting. This is not what we're proposing here, this, this idea of shifting the terms. It's not discipline specific. We're doing this with literature, with art, but it's happening all over the place. It's ha it has been happening for a long time. Indigenous people have been pushing for this for a long time. We just don't listen, uh, but it's happening everywhere. And in academia, you can look at, if you, you can, in, in Canada, you can go over to University of Alberta, Kim Talbert in her relab where it's a, it's a um, uh, research and creation lab. 
uh, she, she, she works with artists and she works with scientists and they're, they're doing this work of shifting the terms. Uh, you can go over to Newfoundland, uh, Max Lebanon, she has uh, her clear lab, which is studying microplastics. She's also trying to shift the terms. Her lab is anti-racist, anti anti-colonial, feminist, right? and she's trying to do these things. Um, if you go to Guatemala, uh, Afedes, it's a it's a, a collective of weavers who are not just a collective. It's not just a collective who you know they just weave. They actually work on um, the production of knowledge and keeping that knowledge and keeping those traditions alive. They they get they gather they get together and they 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 discuss what it means to weave and what these symbols mean. Um, in, in, in Mexico, you have the Zapatistas who have proposed an entirely different way of governance, right? So this is happening everywhere. It's not discipline specific, uh, but we need to see it in our discipline. I guess that's what we're, one of the things we're asking. Um, and the other thing is it also comes in handy when you think of, I mean, um, in terms of uh, recognizing, um, for example, rivers and, and mountains as living beings. This is also happening, there. that shifting of terms, that's also happening there. And those are very important shifts that are hard to do. They're, they're quite difficult, but they're important and they take time, especially if you're coming from um, academia like we are, it takes time because it requires a great deal of work. It requires a great, a great deal of humility. It requires that you check your ego at the door in many ways and it requires that you listen to the people who are doing who who do this who live this um so that's that's sort of to set it up <laughs> i just wanted to set this up for you i'm going to hand it over to paul who's going to get into uh more specifically at seep um i'm trying to think if there was anything else i needed to add but i think that is it uh so i will i will um yeah i'll pass it over to paul i'll Awesome, Rita. Uh, thank you so much. And so now, um, what is TSEEB then in this context, right, in terms of shifting the terms? Um, what exactly are we driving at by saying, you know, unwriting Maya literature, um, you know, we're highlighting TSEEB instead of writing, instead of literature? Well, you know, if you're familiar with Maya studies, broadly speaking, right, um, you know, you're, you're probably familiar with the term TSEEB, and it's this term that's frequently translated as writing. Um, and, you know, if it is writing, and I think in the book, we're definitely very uncomfortable with that translation, um, it is a much more expanded notion of writing. Um, and so if we're gonna use writing in this context, we're not thinking of it in the Euro-Western tradition, we're thinking of it from Tzib, right? And it's full range of possibilities. Um, and so what would those be? Uh, Tzib would include alphabetic texts quite easily. Um, it, it includes textiles, includes painted ceramics, textiles, and you know, quite literally, according to some folks, right, pretty much anything um, that has a pattern on a surface. Um, for example, some scholars have noted, you know, that there are uh, naturally occurring forms of tea, right? Whether uh, it's the pattern on an alligator's back, uh, the diamond pattern on the back of a rattlesnake, uh, the angry pattern of uh, mosquito bites on human skin. Um, you know, all of these things are potentially some kind of form of tea, right? And so, you know, we have to keep this in mind, right? Because it's broadly speaking, it's all of these different manifestations that are potentially dialoguing with each other um, at any kind of given point in time. And I included this glyph here, uh, which is taken from the introduction to um, Hieroglyphicus Mayas by these two uh, authors, because this also appears in one of the essays that we do a lot with in the book uh, by uh, Yucatec Maya intellectual Pedro Ukbe, um, who's incredibly important. And in his analysis, his breakdown of this glyph, uh, the top part, tzi, um, he says, you know, when I look at this, right, what we're looking at is a field in the process of being cleared, right? And so if I, I'll scroll up here, um, you know, you can see the, the tzi part. Um, it's a field in the process of being cleared. It's currently filled, um, you know, with, with some different kinds of weeds and things like this, but we're clearing it as though we would clear a page. And so this is a connection of Tzib to things like not just land in general, right, but also uh, the Maya corn garden, which is something that I'll return to in just a moment. Um, and then the bottom part uh, that he sees there is, you know, is B, right? Uh, Ukbe says, you know, given that we have a foot in the middle of this circle, 
Um, this is actually being, right? Or the verb, literally the verb to go, right? Like uh, Briseida Cuevas Cove, who's a Yucatec Maya poet, has a, uh, a famous poem, uh, Yana Bin Shok, right? Literally translated as you, you, are, you will go to school, right? The being there being a, a future like to go. And so this combination then being tib for Ukbe uh, really kind of ties everything together, right? Um, he says, you know, writing can be walking and vice versa. Um, it's anything that leaves a mark, right? It's making history. And quite independently of this, right? Um, uh, one of the poets that we have worked with, Rita and I, in Snichi Malvayuchil, actually has that line in a poem that he writes, uh, you know, writing is walking. And so, you know, these things in terms of their ability to leave a mark, um, you know, are broadly speaking, uh, geographically distributed, right, um, among different Maya intellectuals, right, who are obviously also in conversation with each other. But it, we can identify it, right, um, as being um, part of a broader Maya philosophy. Um, as Irma Zoli, Zoli points out, uh, Tzib exists in every uh, currently spoken Maya language with the exception of Huasteco, right? And so in, in terms of an approach to making a mark, right, that, you know, is so, on some level also a readable text, this notion is, you know, widely distributed and used by people. And so um, one of the things that in terms of how uh, Ukbe connects it to things like land, to things like the corn garden, um, he says making a milpa, right, which is the, the um, broadly used term for the corn garden, making a milpa um, uh, is something that you do intentional, you clear the space, uh, you plant the seeds so that life is born, the word, history, food for the soul, the word. And so, you know, he's putting this out there, right, that like the, the process itself of making the corn garden is something that is in some sense, you know, not just a readable text, but also literary. And, you know, he doesn't make this connection. Um, but this is something that people have talked about with reference to the Kiche Maya Popol Vuh. But I, um, you know, Rita and I both think this is something that is too frequently set aside, right? And I have my uh, page from the uh, Tedlock translation that I'll read from you. I'll read to you here just very quickly. Um, this is the beginning of the ancient word here in this place called Kiche. Here should we here we shall inscribe, we shall implant the ancient word. And so the narrative voices in the Popol Vuh themselves are speaking of this almost almost multiplicitous sense of tzib, right? So they're inscribing it literally on the page, but they're directly also connecting it to planting things, right? As though the page itself, in some sense, um, can be understood as cleared land in the sense that Utbe is talking about where one plants things. Um, and in a conversation with Hugo Hamioy, uh, at one point, you know, I was talking about this with him and he was making these same connections, right? Like the word that one puts on a page is not unlike a seed that one takes and plants in the ground, right? Um, you know, the seed itself is dead or we think of it as dead, but of course it's not dead, it's potential life. And it's the same thing with words that one uh, prints and puts on a page, right? You close the book, you put it away, no one can see it, the words are dead, but they're not. They're seeds that are planted in the page that come back to life when one reads them. Um, so, you know, all of this um, is informing how we are understanding Tzib and how then we can use Tzib as a point of analysis to think about Maya, uh, contemporary Maya writing writ large. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, Rita, that'd be awesome. And so in the book, uh, we talk about three um, overlapping in some senses, but also three really important dimensions of Tzib um, that explore the relational, spatial, and performatic dimensions, right, of understanding Tzib um, and the potential that it has, right, for understanding this mode of expression. Um, Canel, uh, which is developed by Manuel Bolom and has a relationship to, uh, you know, relational aspects of it, uh, Cholel, uh, which is developed by Maria Mayo Mendoza, who's a Chol intellectual um, and has much more to do with spatial things. In Chaenil, uh, which is developed by the Yucatec Maya um, anthropologist and intellectual Henner Yanes Ortiz. And so just to talk a little bit about these um, in the literary sense a little bit, um, Canel is something, you know, in terms of Tzib, right? Thinking about how Tzib encourages us to rethink our relations, right? Uh, with the text, with each other, uh, with things like land, with things like the clothing that we wear, um, because we understand Tzib as being represented uh, across and in all of these, right? Um, these sort of like separate boxes that we tend to put these things in. 
um, are actually all not just related, but they're in dialogue with each other, right? And so what happens when we separate these things out? Um, you know, obviously you get things like uh, extractivism, right? Taking petroleum out of the ground, um, ignoring the will of certain communities. And so th this, is, this is what is enabled when we lose this sense of relationality that is present within a concept like tea. Uh, Cholel, uh, Maria Mayo Mendoza's um, work is absolutely brilliant. I highly encourage all of y'all to check it out. Um, and she specifically talks about it in relationship to the corn garden, right? Uh, you know, the sense that um, the corn garden is not just a space for the production of food, right? It is also a space for the production of subjectivities, right? Um, not just like where humans learn to interact with each other, but it's an intentionally cleared space in which humans um, learn to interact with also the non-human world. And so again, getting back to that sense of relationality, right? And what happens if we, via Tzib, you know, reconsider all of these different um, texts around us and that we move through, move with, whether or not those are textiles or literature, um, that these are spaces for relating to, you know, not just other humans, but also the non-human world, right? Up to and including the land itself. And finally, Chaimu, um, you know, as a Maya concept of performance, um, you know, uh, Hener in his, in his article on Cha'anil, um, also, you know, all three of these are absolutely um, essential for folks to check out. Um, in uh, Hener's essay on Cha'anil, he talks about how, um, you know, the epigraphist Alexandra Tokovinine um, references Cha'anil as being a glyph that is present on a classic era Maya stella. Right, and it's a king who's dressed up and dancing, performing before his people, and so then Hiner says, you know, well, this is, you know, this can be rethought in terms of contemporary uh, language development efforts, right? Um, in the sense that, you know, even those who are non-Maya speakers can hear and appreciate the text which is read aloud, right? It, it, it's not um, an essentialist gesture that I think lots of folks have taken it as or even, even an, an aggressive gesture, right? Where indigenous language is spoken in a space and is exclusionary, right? It's actually, we can rethink that as, as if via Chani as being something that is inclusive, but encourages you to enter to the best of your ability, right? Um, and then in that sense, right? Um, you know, one is encouraged to learn one or more Maya languages, right? And engage with these texts linguistically. Right, because they are there, and they also contain meaning. Right, they are not sort of um, just aesthetic objects um, that one sort of looks at and says, "Oh, okay, so this is a bilingual text." Right, um, in, in your performance as a reader, you have to also acknowledge. Right, um, you know, I am an imperfect reader. I am an imperfect critic. Right, because I can only read one half of this complete text, which is in Spanish. I cannot read the half that is in Tzotzil, Tzeltal, Yucatec, Chol. Right. Um, which contains its own related universe, right, to the Spanish text. And um, it's not something we go into the talk today, but, you know, reading these bilingual texts is an incredibly complex, um, problematic operation um, that we all do and we encourage everyone to do. But, you know, again, like Rita was talking about earlier, being humble when one does it, right? Um, because the indigenous language text may contain different meanings, other meanings that are encoded in the Spanish. And so then, right, like how do we apply, like rethinking um, some of these texts as Zib, um, how does this then influence how we understand texts? Um, you know, and what we th can then as critics, scholars and readers, uh, how can we relate to them differently? Um, so this is uh, one of a, a famous uh, Maya vase uh, frequently referred to as the blowgunner vase. Um, it's referred to as a codex style vase because it tells a story, right, um, that we can narrate, right? And this particular story is obviously related to the Kiche Maya text of the Popol Vuh, right? And so, it's, you know, when folks will come out and say, oh, well, the Popol Vuh is just a fairy tale, um, you know, influenced by Christianity, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, acknowledging that the knowledge system, you know, something like Tzib is a lot more flexible, right, than knowledge systems that we have coming out of the Euro-Western tradition, um, you know, as Tzib can accommodate right, something like alphabetic writing, you know, the Popol Vuh, you know, th this does not bother us at all, right, if they incorporate elements of Christianity or something like this. This is still very much um, a Maya text, right, that is privileging Maya ways and understanding of the world. 
Now, with regard to see our project in notions of textuality, right, in acknowledging that um, these texts as Tzib have a performatic aspect. So on the blowgunner base here, we have in the center of the image you're looking at uh, Hunapu, right, one hunter, um, who is firing a dart from his blowgun at the celestial bird, Gukumats, who to the left is perched up in a nance tree. Okay, um, and if you look at the very little tip of uh, Hunapu's blowgun, uh, you can see the dart, right, just coming out. He's just blown um, the, the shot that'll knock out one of Gukumats' teeth um, and set the, then the story into motion to defeat him. Now, if you look down the tree, okay, um, you see these two elements. And when we're talking about the Popol Wu and the hero twins, um, you know, there are two of them. The other hero twin is actually present. Um, on the left hand side of the tree, you can see Shpalam K or Jaguar Deer's blowgun sticking out. And then of course, on the right, we have this little Jaguar paw, right? Which is being used, right? To represent um, Jaguar Deer. And so all of this is, you know, present in this vase. And, you know, like as the way, and I've just explained it to you orally uh, rather inartfully. However, um, once again, right? This is a scene from the Popol Vuh, and this is from the Tedlock translation. And here, as in many other passages in the Popol Vuh, right, this is not as though someone is reading from a text, right? Like I would sit down and read a text uh, to friends, like we sit down and read texts to each other. Like if you pay attention to what uh, Tedlock is saying, and, and Tedlock uh, himself points this out, it is as though, right, the narrative voices are pointing at pictures. So it's the relationship of things like glyphs to pictures combined with the ceremony itself of reading the document that give the Popol Vuh its full expression. So, and I'll um, talk about this, uh, and I'll read this just, just so you can hear it. Um, and here is the shooting of seven macaw by the two boys. We shall explain the defeat of each one of those who engage in self-magnification. This is the great tree of seven macaw, a nance, and this is the food of seven macaw. And again, you can hear how the narrative voices are pointing to pictures. Um, in order to eat the fruit of the nance, he goes up the tree every day. Since Hunapu and Shpalanke have seen where he feeds, they are now hiding beneath the tree of seven macaw. They are keeping quiet here, the two boys in the leaves of the tree. And when Miss Seven Macaw arrived, perched over his meal, the nance, it was then that he was shot by Hunapu. The blowgun shot went right to his jaw, breaking his mouth. And so when we look at the Popol Vuh as though it were simply a literary text that we sit down and read as today, for example, we might sit down and read the Bible, the latest novel or something like that. We are missing what the narrative voices themselves are literally demonstrating for us, right? It's not just the reading of the glyphic manuscript. It is also the, perform the performatic nature of the ritual that is attending to the reading of that, right? We perform it today, in problematically in a different way, right? And so this is kind of a problem. And so I will um, actually leave off there for just a moment and pitch it back to Rita um, to talk about, you know, um, uh, my uh, uh, musician that we talked to briefly um, about some of these facets of the Popol Vuh that are completely forgotten, right? And, and I think this is very much Rita's story uh, instead of mine. So if, if, do you wanna talk about that just briefly, Rita? Yeah, before sorry. we go on to, yeah. to Madrid? So, um... Yeah, when was it? 20, 2019, we visited uh, Chishot, Comalapa, which is a, it's a town full of artists. And when we were there, we visited the workshop of a musician. And this man, Luis Chelli, he's absolutely brilliant. He, he, he studied a lot of the stuff. He's, he's talked to elders to try to understand um, music. He's a musician and he, he, creates, he creates instruments. He also has people bring to him instruments that have been passed down, pre-Hispanic instruments uh, that people don't know how to play. And so this man, and he's, he, I, I can't even begin to explain how fabulous he is, but he can, you can, any instrument you can, you can give him and he can figure out how to play it. And so when we were there, he showed us a, a couple different instruments. And one of them was a, it looked like a, it was a skull, I'm trying to remember. And you, you blew into it. I think it was, you blew into the ear and it produced sound through the mouth, which is, mm -hmm. I mean, right there, it's amazing. <laughs> But one of the things he said to us, he's like, this sound is the sound of the underworld. This is the sound that you would hear when you're reenacting the Popol Vuh. 
And I thought, wait a second, we've never heard of music and Popol Vuh put together. Like that was the first time I heard of this. And he said to me, yeah, the Popol Vuh is accompanied by sounds. It's not just the acting, the this, the that, but it's also, there are sounds that make it a, a complete experience for all your senses. Um, and maybe after I can show you, I can show you one of the instruments he gave me of a, of a uh, woodpecker, uh, which is awesome because he also invents uh, instruments. He goes out in the woods and he looks around and then he, he creates instruments. Um, but he's, he's absolutely fabulous. And this, this notion of, of sounds accompanying the telling of the creation story adds another layer to, to this performatic um, character that we've been talking about. And, and it complicates it even further because literature doesn't really look at music in that sense, right? So it, it complicates it a little bit further. So I'll, I'll pass it back to Paul. Um, you know, another aspect of this, right, is textuality itself, right? In our sense of texts, how they're used, what they're used for. And, um, you know, so, uh, this is a folio 59 from the Madrid Codex. Um, and, you know, and so, you know, at first gloss, right? Like, why are we showing you the highly uninteresting and blank um, backside of a famous Maya Codex, right? With all kinds of glyphs and other cool things happening in it. Um, and I would draw your attention to the very bottom um, of this page. And there you can kind of see, right? And I don't know if you can make it out there. Um, there is a little, uh, it's, it's a piece of European paper, right? Where you can kind of see there's writing down there at the bottom. And there was a scholarly debate uh, first put forward by Michael Coe, um, arguing that you could use uh, this piece of paper to date the manuscript itself, right? Um, and, you know, to perhaps even to the last uh, Maya kingdom to fall, right? In uh, Nopeten up in Guatemala in 1697, right? Um, and, you know, how, you know, to talk about, right, the tradition of Maya scribes is something that was continued, right, like well into almost, you know, the end of the 17th century. And so, the, and he argues that, you know, this is perhaps a piece of European paper that was incorporated into the manufacture of the codex, codex itself. And then a few years, uh, just a few years ago, John Chuchiak actually says like, no, right, it is not something that was done that way. It's actually a patch, right, um, that is placed over the manuscript, right, which you can tell, right, it is not in great condition, right, it, it is fraying uh, quite obviously. And so, you know, it, it, it's placed on there uh, by my person to protect the manuscript, right. Um, for our purposes here, the thing that Chuchiak says that's uh, really interesting, fascinating, and important is that this is actually a page or a piece of a papal bull, right, that, that would have been sold, uh, you know, during the colonial era. And Chuchiak says, you know, probably placed there by a Maya person tasked with caring for the manuscript. And in that context, then, you know, is likely like why a papal bull as opposed to other documents, right? It's because it's something that incorporates, right, the spiritual power of the papal bull and claims it, right, for the Maya manuscript itself. And so we're talking about, right, this sense of textuality and like, you know, the notion that as with the Popol Vuh, um, letters are being used to support, right, this like much larger performatic context. Here we have physically, right, a European document and the power that it has being used to not just support, but enhance, right, a fraying Maya manuscript. And so this is incredibly important to understand, like, what is happening there, right? And I think like as a, as a physical object, right, um, it's a really amazing example, right, of these multiple textualities and how th they can be combined um, in ways that, you know, for an outsider might say, well, this is contradictory and, you know, assimilative or whatever, but it's not, right? Because um, from a, the perspective of the people doing this, right, th these things are not contradictory. Right, of the, the knowledge system is flexible enough to incorporate things, right, without the contradictions um, that folks may see seemingly from the outside. And so, like talking about this, um, the the main point of departure we have um, in the book to talk about this sense of textuality and how we perform texts um, is weaving, right. And I think in a lot of senses, um, it's much easier because there's a there's an established Western style scholarship talking about weaving. Um, that Rita and I use, right, to really open up this discussion. Um, and it's important to acknowledge, right, um, that, you know, as Rita was doing earlier uh, with the Mujeres Aferes, right, and the notion that, you know, weavings are the books the colony could not burn. Um, this is something also uh, 
talked about by Maya authors and writers, right? The Canjobal author and intellectual Gaspar Pedro Gonzalez actually wrote a book called Kotsi Nuestra Literatura Maya. A literal translation for our purposes here would be our Tzib, our Maya literature. And very subtly, right, as uh, Gonzalez lays out, right, what Maya literature under Tzib would be, um, includes this picture, right, this graphic of Maya weaving, saying, you know, these are other examples of Tzib. And so, like, once again, right, like, he's, he, it, it's not like Kotzib uh, came out two years ago, right? Like Kotzib, I think, came out in the mid-90s. You know, already signaling, right, that when we're talking about Tzib, right? This is something, this is a, like a much broader sense of textuality, right? Um, with which all of our different um, works are dialoguing. And that's something that we're going to come back to um, in just a few minutes. Um, so if Rita, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so then it becomes a, a matter of how do we understand text textiles, right? And the kind of meetings that are encoded in textiles and what's happening here. And so three, I, here I have three pictures. Um, of, uh, that have to deal with the town of Oshchuk. Um, and so on the left, it's a representation of a human figure from Gil Corredor um, uh, wearing a traditional garment with a square in the middle of the chest. Uh, the middle picture is a close-up of the, of the huipil that is on the far right, um, which is a huipil that is in some senses quote traditional and other senses uh, completely quote modern, um, where you have uh, four white stripes uh, enter, you know, um, alternating with white, uh, four purple stripes alternating with white stripes, and then you have um, four squares in the middle, right, alternating um, orange and black. And so within this context, right, how do we understand what's happening here? Um, this is a wipil that comes from the uh, co-op Halabil, uh, owned by a friend of ours, uh, Tere Santis, right? If you're ever in San Cristobal de las Casas, Jalebil has a little shop. Uh, they're at the end of the Guadalupe uh, walking street, uh, just below the church of Guadalupe. Um, and in talking to her about this, right? Like, like what, what are the meanings um, that are encoded in um, this, uh, this garment? Um, the four little uh, peaks, right, or... Um, kind of almost arrow designs that you see up around the collar are references to both uh, the jaguar's teeth as well as uh, the mountains that are around uh, the town of Oschuk. Um, and then kind of going to the, the squares in the center there, um, this is actually a reference to a, a really old Central American design. Um, if you look at uh, codices, right, you will see pictures like the Florentine Codex. Uh, there are frequently women wearing a garment with a square, right, one large square in the middle um, of the chest. So this, this is kind of a callback, right? That's citing these previous precedents. Um, but of course here there are four, right? And you know, the number four is always a call out on some level to the four cardinal directions. And so, you know, squares are associated with this, diamond shapes are associated with this. Um, and so we have, you know, not just one square, but we got four squares, right? And one of the ways before we kind of move out to the broader implications of this, um, and philosophically what's happening here, um, one of the things that connects Maya weaving to people, right, and as well as to the land itself, it's to keep in mind, is um, the, hu the human form itself, um, it stands in for both the number one and the number 20, right, mathematically speaking, right? Uh, one, of the, one of the ways to say uh, 20 in many Maya languages is vinik, right, hun vinik. And to count upwards from there, you would say, you know, um, 20 plus one towards the next vinik. As well as in weaving then, um, Typically, but not always, um, weaving is done in units of vinik, right, which are 20 threads, like grouped together. And, you know, in terms of how adept um, Maya weavers are with that math, right, they can, uh, you know, having seen this, uh, they can tell you more or less how long it will take to weave a garment, right, based on the number of vinik in the garment and, you know, and the measurements that they are given. Um, and so within this context, right, with, you know, the connection between, you know, the number 20, things like squares, uh, the cosmos, the calling out to the four cardinal directions, when a person wears a garment like this, right, the individual square, right, references the four cardinal directions, then all four of them together do, and then the human does, right, also referencing the four cardinal directions. And the Maya mathematician uh, Roche, like, talks about this, you know, then in this context, then, um, you know, Maya towns themselves 
are frequently, not always, but frequently laid out intentionally according to the four cardinal directions. And so you end up with this notion that there is an oscillation between the squares on the garment, right, to the human, to the town, to the space of the town and the cosmos itself. And then of course you're left with the idea, right? That when a person puts on this garment, it's something of a commonplace in Maya studies. You know, the woman who wears this garment is herself at the center of the cosmos, but it's not this woman at the center of these cosmos. It's this woman is at the center of a cosmos and she is cosmos moving among other cosmos, right? As she interacts with other humans moving through the town, right? And so, you know, Philosophically speaking, others have noted this, right? I mean, fractals and you know non-Euclidean non geometry and things like this are already encoded in a lot of indigenous understandings of the cosmos, right? In a lot of ways, so-called so Western science is catching up, right? <laughs> From a position of being far behind. And so if you wanna go to the next slide, Rita. Um, and so this is another um, garment. Um, and to, to come, may, maybe um, come back down, um, and to ways of reading and understanding this that are a little bit more um, closer right, to history and things that are easier to understand. Um, the garment on the left, uh, these come from the Tzobol Ansetik Cooperative um, from San Pedro Chenalo. And so uh, the garment on the, on the left is predominantly in a red palette. Um, the garment on the right is predominantly purple and black. And comparing these two, you can see, right, one of the things that it's really hard for folks to understand is that uh, designs can be read longitudinally, right? Um, this design itself, um, you can find an earlier version of it on um, the lintel of Lady Shok, right, which comes from Yashchilan, right? So this is an ancient design but it's not as though it comes down completely unchanged, right? These designs are always changing. Weavers are always innovating, right? Um, and one of the uh, quotes that we pull in the book, right, is from Cherry Pancake, who says, you know, a, a, a woven garment is basically a recording of its own weaving, right? And, and the choices, historically speaking, that a weaver makes at all moments of its production. So these don't exist outside of time. They're actually documents about specific actions that a specific woman takes, right, as she harnesses tradition to produce them. And so the one on the right coming, uh, you know, from the 70s and 80s, you will still see women, um, occasionally older women, wearing um, this garment in San Pedro Chinalo. One of the important things to understand what's happening in these understandings of the cosmos um, is this cosmos design that you see there um, has um, eight, uh, so eight, <laughs> Losing track of where I am. It, it, it has, you know, eight different um, curly cues coming out of it, right, from the, from the four points, right? It's a diamond shape in the middle, and with the eight curly cues coming out um, on all sides. This is a notion of the, of the cosmos that is not oriented north-south, but kind of like Rita was talking about earlier, is actually oriented east-west, right, and towards processes that are non-hierarchical, right? Um, you know, if you set out walking east today, right, you can walk forever and never get to a fixed point, which is east, whereas, you know, the north, right, we have the north pole, like eventually you'll uh, get to the north pole, so that it, it's a quite different way of thinking about the planet and how we are oriented towards it, right? Here, it's always oriented toward um, movements of the sun, and so the very middle diamond there, right, this is actually um, a design, which is a composite of several designs. The diamond in the middle, right, if you bracket out all of the curly cues, that's, the, that's you know, a design which is called our father, the sun, okay? Um, if you kind of go out then and you look at the two curly cues on the sides, there are the four curly cues on the sides, this is a design for the butterfly, right, which is, you know, another, the sun in movement. And so then like in the full scope of what's happening here, and you can see this much more clearly on um, the, the cosmos designs from the Rainsar and Tenehapa, right? This is actually a um, representation of a uh, two dimension representation of four dimensional space time, right? Because the sun is always in movement, right? It's always at noon, it's always at, um, at midnight, it is always rising and setting. And of course, as you can see on the garment, right, it's not one cosmos design, the entire neck, right, has cosmos designs. And the last thing I'll kind of say about this in terms of like looking at changes over time, um, you know, you can use looking at these documents, right, or looking at these textiles, um, you know, women will talk about, well, well, you know, the reason we use this thread here is because like this is when the road came 
or this color came, you know, when this event happened, right? And we got uh, greater access to things and how that access changes what weavers can do. And so the we feel on the right then, um, this purple and black color palette is enabled by the fact that all of a sudden, um, over time, women have access to things like metallic thread in which you can see the other designs that are um, encircling um, the Cosmos designs on this Weepio. And of course, the other thing there is the um, something they called um, uh, the running stitch, I believe in English, right? Gained popularity. And so all of a sudden the women started, it's like, okay, well, we can raise, right? How thick this design is. And if you don't know what you're looking at, the design on the right barely looks intelligible in terms of the design on the left, but they're the same design. And if you know what you're looking at, you have no problems reading it or acknowledging that they are in fact the same design. Um, and in some some cases, um, you know, and Walter Morris talks about this. Um, you know, some women will are so adept at this they can raise that design on the wheel to about half an inch in thickness, right? So it completely, right? Like you you look at it and you're like, wow, like a that's hot, um, but b you know, that is the level at which, you know, these designs are read by people that understand them, right? And also how they change over time. So, um, so one of the thing, I know there was a lot about weaving. Um, I hope, I hope your minds are blown. Um, <laughs> weaving is, is um, super interesting. And it's even more interesting when you start looking at writing through that lens of weaving. So not looking at writing like weaving, but as weaving which is a bit of a shift, right? And it, it, it requires a, a little bit of work. So one of the poets we wanna talk about is Roberta Bautista. She's um, Totsil, she's absolutely brilliant. She's from uh, Wistan, Chiapas, lives in, in um, San Cristobal de las Casas. And the, the book we're talking about is um, El Telar Luminario, which literally translates to Luminous Loom. Um, and this is from uh, Pluralia Editions. If you if you were to buy this book, it actually comes with a, a CD, right, Paul? If I yes. Correctly? Yeah, yep. it comes with a yep. CD. And so um, Bautista is really interesting. She's an anthropologist. She studied uh, anthropology, and she's a writer. And in one one of her one interviews she had, she talked about how her activism, her political activism, is through her writing. And this is important because for her, at one point. She was. Uh, she 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 talks about this. She had to choose between uh, joining the Zapatistas full on or working on her writing, and she decided to work on the writing because for her it's an instrument to do the work that needs to be done. And I'm gonna I'm gonna read you a, a quote uh, from an interview she gave with uh, Mardonio Carvalho, where I think uh, it'll it'll allow you to see how she positions herself as a writer, but also her philosophy about writing and about the things that she demands we do with her writing, right? She says, um, my approach to literature takes up this historical process and arises with this idea of showing the other, and we're the other, that we also have our own poetry and art because it's not just in literature. In the arts in general, we have our own painters, sculptors, singers, dancers. Everything has a philosophical and a scientific charge, but dominant society has made, has made us believe it isn't so. Uh, so this quote is really interesting because, um, and we're going to look at, at a poem next, uh, because it brings up this um, notion that there's a lot of knowledge elsewhere that we've been ignoring because dominant society has said it isn't so. And there's a, an important aspect of gender here as well. Uh, the majority of weavers are women. Men do weave, but it's not as common and it's not in the same way with this um, with this loom, it's a it's a little bit different. With a lot of the men do they do uh, the, the um, uh, what's it called with uh, the pie the um, uh, it's a little bit different. It's yeah I, I forget the name right now, but it's it's a little bit different what uh, the men do. So the women are the ones who weave mostly, and so they're the ones who are working with this uh, philosophical concepts. They're the work the ones who work uh, with the this notion of the cosmos. They're the ones who do this. So what does it mean? when we're talking about literature and we're talking about the primacy of the written word and we're leaving everything else out because it doesn't fit. We're indeed marginalizing that knowledge that, that women produce. And so when Ruperta writes about uh, the Telar Luminario, there is something really interesting happening there. Uh, this book, uh, Telar Luminario, 
in we talked to her about about the the title and a couple choices she made um so the first word the in in the in the tzotzim shogobat means light or illumination and the second word um halopte and I'm, my pronunciation is terrible um the root for that word means both weaving and a long time so there's this notion that we're dealing with something that is um ancient right but also ongoing and that's important to note because usually when we talk about ancient uh things ancient history it's it's way in the past but in this sense it's something that is dynamic and it's present uh, so some of the topics that she brings up in this in this in this book have to do with time and weaving time is very important uh, but also sort of macrocosms and microcosms is always very important and we see this not just with her um also like uh, Calista, Calista Gabriel Chiquin uh, who we talk about in the book, she also does this. She's also very interested in that macro, macro, microcosm. And it's not, it's not just, I don't think it's just that they're interested in it. It's how they see the world, this macrocosm and this microcosm, and this constant moving in and out of it, or being in it at all times, I guess it would be probably better. So I'm going to go to the next slide, which is actually the poem, Rupert's uh, poem. There we go. And I've included it here in English and Tzotzil. Ruperta wrote this in, in Tzotzil. She did her own translation into the Spanish and Paul actually translated it into, uh, into English. And so Paul is going to read it in Tzotzil. I, I don't read or, or speak any uh, Maya languages, but Paul does. So, and he, he took some Tzotzil classes. So I think, I think uh, uh, he's going to read it for us. So I'll let you go, Paul. Awesome. Inetel, aya, kopo li tonetike. Anal shushubahel, aya, te sob y climan, och te spectsat me on kerem, skush yonton, te smetnal on mol, spukespa te ix tonta, umetel seo, scupimbe, ihils hol, yonton li ansetik, al samehik, sko li borcole, scusbe lok el, slavenel vitnal, ibiltahem te yonton. Teklumetik, Satsut Taspe, Yutsil Sliker Kushlehal, Shal Saleb Yipoko, Iihal, Kehatik, Te Salob, Te Halometik, Stapane Kushlehal. Thank you so much. See, I couldn't have done that. Uh, but anyway, so that's that's a Tzotzi version, and there's a, there's a bunch of things. This is a it's a beautiful poem. It's quite complex. I I'm not going to go into every single part of it because it's it's just too much. But there's a couple of things that are really interesting here. Um, for one, uh, Ruperta like, evokes all senses. There's this funny play. There's hearing, sight, smell, touch, and there's also the absence of taste in that hunger, that laughing hunger rooted in our community, so she says, right, which is also a very powerful political statement. But all the senses are called forth here. And it's interesting because these senses are what make up that material for the woven text that she creates. She talks about weaving ancestral secrets, right? And it's all these senses, all these experiences. And we know uh, that a lot of indigenous cultures are experiential, right? You learn through doing, it's not, it's not through a book. So it's a little bit different. And it's interesting because that's what's creating these senses, this ancestral knowledge. Um, one of the things that you might have noticed is in the last verse, it's in Tzotzil. The English translation is in Tzotzil, that last verse, those last two words, Chapanej Kushlehal. And she does the same thing in Spanish. And what she does is she includes a little note and it says, Artesanas de la Vida. So this is like an epithet of, of, uh, of the weavers, artisans, artisans of life. And it's really interesting. We asked her, we actually asked her, like, what do you mean with this? And, and she said to us, she's like, this is, this, this is a concept that you can't translate. That's why I left it as this. And it means artisan, artist, maker, builder, director of life. And the other thing is Kushlehal is another really interesting concept. So you have this, this idea of a, of a builder, constructor, erector of life. And then you have Kushlehal, which it, usually it's plainly translated into Spanish as just life or existence. But when you ask, um, when you ask Ruperta or you read uh, Miguel Ruiz, for example, they talk about this. It actually is much more complex and it has to do with the relationship between humans, nature and the cosmos. So it's not just my life, it's my life and the life of those around me, the cosmos and nature. 
Um, so it's really interesting because what you have here then is with this epithet, right? You have weavers, but there's a small shift, almost like, a, like a calibrating this. We have this move from weaver to artisan, uh, which is really important when we think about it in terms of Tzib, because Bautista presents this idea of, of women as your architects of existence, right? The women, women are the weavers. They're the weavers of lives lived, right? And they're also interpreters of the cosmos. So you have this entire, um, what she's doing here, she, she's, um, she brings us to this idea that knowledge and its production happens in textiles, something that we've been ignoring because they're not written in pen and paper. <laughs> Uh, so what she does here is she's trying to bring us around and trying to make us understand that there is much more happening uh, that we tend to ignore, and that in fact, and this is not, and this is not exclusive to her, but this is, I mean, a beautiful poem. But you can also find it, like I said, in other um, uh, women poets who write about this. So there's a very gender perspective uh, that you, or sorry, there's a really huge gender component when you look at this as well, because like I said, women are weavers, Maya women. Uh, are the ones who weave. So when you're considering where knowledge is produced, it's not produced uh, solely by men, but it's produced by the women who are weaving. And those, those, those stories, uh, those connections to the earth are integrated into the, that textile, right? And passed on. So, so it's interesting that she uses this instrument, her writing, to, to um, uh, revitalize and, and, and sort of give, not new life because that life has always existed, but, but bring it to the forefront because we keep ignoring it, right, uh, of, of the textiles. Um, I'm gonna move really quickly, shifting gears just slightly to Walter Pasjo, who's a cachiquel, and he is uh, an actif. He's a, he, he describes himself as a Maya scribe. He's a, a young man who does, um, who's, really interested in working with glyphs and the image that you had if you saw the poster that the that, that announced this talk that image was of the rabbit um Kumul. and it was it was kind of cheeky of us too but uh that image was used he made it yeah i was laughing uh it's an open source image so if you want to if you want to have access to it uh we're happy to to you know let you have the file because it is open access um but one of the things with that image, he created this image to show, um, it, was, it was made as a protest. It's, it's almost like a protest, uh, like a poster that you take. And it's actually quite literally cursing out politicians in Guatemala. <laughs> it was done in 2016, I believe the other one, for, for, for protesting. And the glyphs that he includes is a bunch of like, it's like ladrones, thieves, uh, anyway, he just curses out all the politicians and he makes it available so people can take it and, and use it corrupt, all, like all the things you can imagine. And there's uh, one or two swear words in there too. Um, but uh, he is really interesting because he goes back to glyphs. He says, uh, you know, glyphs are, are, are important, but more than that, he's interested in bringing glyphs um, to us using that writing, right, that used to be codices and, and sculpted rocks and give them a different platform, right? So there's this drive to recover and reconstruct and revitalize and connect to that ancestral knowledge. But also when he does this, when he's like, and I don't wanna say recuperate in the way it is, but, but it's also continuing that tradition and updating it. So we're talking about that, those updates, right, that happen. He's updating it using different tools. And in this case, it's digital tools. Right? He's using digital tools to create these images. And this is the one I included in, in this PowerPoint. It's Chuen, is the monkey, the monkey scribe. And he, he describes it as this. He sings with his voice and with his hands. So this harkens back to the Papua Vuh, right? That notion that you have this multiplicity of, of textualities. It's not just one thing. There's a couple of things happening here. You have to listen, you have to write, you have to do all these things. It's not just the one thing. Um, and Walter Pasjok, like I said, he's, he's brilliant. If anyone's looking for a tattoo, you can commission him. <laughs> he, will, he will draw a tattoo for you. So just so you know, just, just putting it out there in case you're interested. Uh, but that's Walter Pasjok. And with this idea of the glyphs, I'm gonna pass it off to Paul. Awesome, thank you, Rita. Um, and so then another, um, I think, you know, coming from Ruperta and then Walter, um, this really sets up well, sets us up well to talk about uh, Negma Koi, uh, who's a Kashikel, 
a poet, painter, and translator from Chishot, right? Uh, San Juan Comalapa in Guatemala. Um, Negma also participates in this movement to recover writing in glyphs. And she does it right from this kind of multimedia, um, multi-form perspective. And, you know, in some ways, right, um, a writer like Negma is the embodiment. Um, if any of you are familiar with uh, either Chadwick Allen's Trans Indigenous or Daniel Heath Justice's uh, most recent book, uh, Why Indigenous Literatures Matter, and how these two scholars talk explicitly about, right, um, you know, literature can be found in all of these other things, right? Um, it's writing with Latin script is one option among many um, in um, Allen's words. And, you know, uh, Heath Justice talks about how, you know, the Cherokee literature is not just things written on a page. It includes um, wampum belts. It includes, um, you know, culturally modified trees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, right, I mean, these are, these are not even necessarily just kind of like things that Maya uh, people are doing, right? But hey, hemispherically, right? This is where um, uh, some of really incredible scholarship is being done. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next slide, uh, Rita. And so this is, these are some examples of Negma's work, right? Um, on the top left there, um, these, th this is a poem called Aslem or Vida um, that she had uh, for distribution at um, uh, a conference I met her at in Colombia and Bogota several years ago. And right, she includes the, the actual um, title of the poem in glyphs, right? Like one of the things that challenges us um, in terms of being scholars and critics is to, you know, both, you know, how do we enter into a glyphic text, right? Um, because all of a sudden we have a text that's not just bilingual between Kashikil and Spanish, but we also have a text that is quite, you know, also, you know, I guess we would call it bi-scriptural, right? We, it, it's in both Latin script and, you know, glyphs. So how, how do we analyze the glyphic text? Um, and hearkening back to the quote that Rita used um, at the beginning of the talk, right? Um, this is a moment in which like those of us who cannot read glyphs are quite literally illiterate in multiple forms, right? I cannot read the Kachikel and I also can't read the glyphs. So like a, as a reader, like what am I to do? Um, and so that's the, that's the top left image. Um, going down below that, right? Um, to, to talk about, right? Like these, these are things that one can read. Um, so this is actually a glyph, um, you know, Negma is a good friend of both of ours, um, and uh, my daughter's name is Elena, um, and she's named after a town where uh, my wife and I have a number of really dear friends, right, which is called Santa Elena, and even though it sounds like a Hispanic name, it's actually not, right, um, it actually means uh, burnt house, right, and there's a whole story as to why it's burnt house, but it's Elena, and so I asked Negma if for my daughter's uh, birthday a few years ago, you know, I was like, is there any way you would write uh, Elena um, in glyphs? And so this is actually um, reading from the top left to the right, from the bottom left um, to then the right. Uh, this is Elena, right? How one can read that. Um, and so, you know, it's E, the, the top left. Le is the glyph that kind of looks like a, a, a fingertip there. Na is the kind of the face on the bottom there and ah, right, being the, the glyph, um, the bottom part there on the bottom right that looks like an open mouth. And so Negma is leveraging all of these things, right, like in her work. And a lot of times these uh, get treated as simply being symbolic gestures, right, in scholarship. No one can actually read that, right? Um, you know, th this is a symbolic gesture. And even though, right, uh, most Maya folks themselves are, cannot read glyphs, right? Like that is 100% that is true. Um, on the other hand, it is no less true that this is a form of literacy, uh, like Rita was talking about, that people are actively working to recover, full stop, right? These are things that can be read. And, you know, ethically, as we develop approaches to literature like this, um, I think, you know, we have to ask ourselves, like, well, why aren't we reading them, <laughs> right? Uh, like, in, like Rita has been talking about, it requires us to do a lot more work than just sitting down and thinking of the text and alphabetic script as being kind of an ends unto itself. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, going back, hearkening back to weaving, um, this is a section of Negma's poem, um, uh, Lienzos de Herencia, that in, in the translation, I think I translated, I went completely away from Lienzos and went with our woven histories. But uh, the Wipil is a huggable poem made by our ancestors, a codex of threads that the invaders could not disappear. It is our culture's memory. Yeah. It is science, it is art, it is a living calendar. Right, getting back again to many of the ideas that Rita has been pointing out, right, that you know all of these things are encoded in the repeal, right, if one knows how to read them. So I will kick it back to you, Rita. And so, and I should we should mention um, Nigma also works in in a really interesting form. She's created a, a book of poetry, mm -hmm. Kikotem, which looks like a codex. So it's long, and this is put out by uh, uh, I forgot the name. Chosama, right? Chosama, Chosama, mm -hmm. that's right. Chosama. And and so and they've done they've done uh, they've actually done codices, mm -hmm. but in this case it's it's a, a collection of poetry that she's done as a codex, right? And that implies different ways of reading it too, like interacting with the with the printed text. As readers, we we can we can. Uh, pair things a little bit differently we can we can play with it differently and there's also uh and, and this is some, something else we're working on um a comic book that's come out inspired in manga and and this young man uh, Luis Chali, he does he also does codices um uh, his his manga comes out like in codices and he's he's really interested in that and going back to that form and exploring that form and what that means so i'll, I'll leave it there with the codices and this this kind of thing let me go to the next one because i think okay so one, la one poem I want to share with you is Humberto Cabal, uh, Tejedor. I'm going to go back to Cabal. And this is a poem that's quite beautiful. I chose this one. Uh, there were others that probably would have been a bit better for, for what I want to do with it. But it's a really beautiful poem. It's in Quiche, but in this case, I brought the Spanish and the English because I can't read Quiche. And I wouldn't want to put Paul through that. Um, but it basically it reads, Tilintes hebras, salan, salan, salan. La lanzadera de la trama. Ella carda lana el teje. Ella en madeja y el ponchero sigue tejiendo. So with this poem, it's actually really interesting. Humberto Cabal uh, is from Amostenango, and there, one of the things that the town is known for, it's its ponchos, these heavy woolen blankets. And this is one of the things that this is where Cabal started as a weaver. Uh, he started weaving ponchos. And in this poem, it's really interesting because that um, he brings in a couple of things. I mean, there, the, you know, the, the, there's that sound of the talan, salan, salan, the, the, the shuttle going through and, and, and rubbing up against the threads. You can hear it, right? When you're reading this poem, you can actually hear that sound. You, can, you, can, um, uh, you get the rhythm of that motion of weaving. Um, but another thing too, is that he brings in, and this is interesting, this, this notion of complementarity, of Maya complementarity, my, uh, men and women which is, I mean, this is hotly debated uh, with, with some Maya activists and women, they say, you know, that this is romanticized and it's a problem because uh, Maya men will use it to, to actually um, uh, put down women and not help them out. But there are other people who really, some other activists and feminists who believe, they, they like this notion, this idea of the, of the complementarity of, of men and women, where they each they each have a function, and Anna Cabal does that quite beautifully, right? Like that you have, uh, she's balling the wool, she he's weaving, she he cards the wool, he's weaving, right? So you have this back and forth again, that movement of the weaving, but also that notion of, of complementarity. Um, and also one other thing he does here, which is interesting, is that he brings us a new form of weaving. Usually when you read about weaving, when you talk about weaving, there's women, and, not, and certainly not poncho weaving in, in Momostenango. So he does something really interesting here uh, with this poem, I think. Um, it, it's, it's quite interesting, it's quite uh, uh, fabulous. And he does, he has other poems that uh, I would bring, but I didn't have time and, and we don't have time, um, where he works with words and he weaves them in the poem. He says there are different words for a poem, palabra miel, and he does it, he does it in Spanish and in quiche. Uh, so he, he, he's very aware of what it implies to weave words and what it implies to weave textile. I'm going to stop here because we have one last thing that we want to share. Uh, and Paul, you wanted to talk about this briefly? Sure. Um, so this is one of um, Humberto Acabal's perhaps most famous performances, most famous poems um, called Shalo Lilo Lelele. And this is an onomatopoetic poem. And, you know, as Rita was talking about, you know, one of the things that he does, right, is he really pushes 
um, you know, via this kind of sense of performance, right? Um, how people can appreciate a poem, how can people appreciate sounds. Um, he has an entire um, sequence of poems, for example, that is onomatopoetic, that are the names of birds, right? And it's like, for example, um, and you can look these up, they're absolutely brilliant. But like, for example, the, the Maya word for um, hummingbird is tunun, right? And, and that, that is the poem, right? Like Akabal uh, would giving a performance would say tunun, tunun, right? And it's onomatopoeic, which is the name also of the bird in Maya, right? And so it, 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 it's, it was amazing to hear him develop these. Um, and so this is a brief video that I was able to take um, at the Feria Internacional del Libro. Um, when a lot of folks uh, that I was with, we went to, up to uh, Lake Guatevita. Um, and uh, playing the pan flute is going to be Freddy Chicangana, um, the Quechua poet. And across from them is going to be, um, it, wearing a purple poncho, is going to be Hugo Hamioy. But you know, this kind of performance, right? And like what people are using it for um, in this kind of context um, is, is really powerful. But you know, talking about the performatic aspects of these poems, um, I think it's also really important, right? Like, how are they performed? Like, like what are they done, right? And so this is a particular context in which this poem is performed. Um, so Rita, if you wanna play that for everybody. And that's Akaba uh, saying the poem. Okay. <laughs> Should mention this poem. Acabal refused. There, there's no translation for it. When you when you get the book, or at least in Animalero, it's 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 the poem in in Quiche, and there's no translation for it. And I believe in another collection, it's the poem, and then there's a blank page <laughs> for the translation <laughs> into Spanish, right? So he's he's also playing with that, and he describes this as the song, I think, of uh, the mountain, of going up to the mountain, um, and it's again, it's just sounds, and it, it's really interesting because this poem, poems like this, and uh, other poems require that performance, right? They require that they be performed or you, or you miss out. And one of the things that, to me, it's always kind of funny, people say, well, you can't always do that. Um, but we have internet and technology and YouTube. <laughs> we can do this and we should be doing this, right? We have the, like the perfect combination of elements to be doing this and to be highlighting that performance which the poem's asking for, right? Which Akabal is begging us to to do, to 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 present, because otherwise you lose a whole lot. Um, I, Paul, I don't know if you want to add anything. No, yeah, I mean completely, right? I mean, and, and this is like one of the fascinating things about you know thinking about um, this kind of cultural production via tib as opposed to literature, right? Because, um, and I know we we published an article about this together. Um, we tend to think of techno technology, right, as being like a matter of linear progression, right, and, uh, uh, doing things, right, like, you know, whether it's the technology itself or the science behind it, right, and, you know, we're trained to think of this, particularly coming out of that Euro-Western, like, th scope of things, for lack of a better way to put it. However, right, like you're saying, it's like, actually, like we still haven't caught up, right, to what is being done with a lot of these texts, right, and what a lot of these authors and intellectuals are asking us to do, right, and we're still not fully taking advantage of things like the internet um, or other modes of representation to, you know, to, to produce better scholarship, to rethink how we do things, um, and, and also to collaborate better um, with members um, of, you know, Maya communities, with indigenous communities, you know, across the globe. So, all right, and I think I think with that we're going to close, and we're going to open it up for questions, comments, complaints. So, thank you so much for for listening to us for 
this whole time. Yes, it's been an absolute honor. Many thanks to everyone um, who came out today. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you for your patience. And thank you again, Rita and Paul for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. We are so, so grateful to have you with us today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you honored, everyone. Honored for the invite. Thanks everybody for coming out.